in real life, in person, talking about the metaverse. We are going meta on meta. <laughs> and uh, it's a thrill to really be here in person, guys. I think uh, maybe I will speak for this community, um, just reflecting on the energy of the city, the energy of this environment, and really thanking uh, Filecoin for creating a platform in which we can really share ideas. So I'm Angie Lau, I'm editor and chief founder of Forecast News. Thrilled to be here with Matthew Hurl of Mona, and also Jonathan Palmer of Peregrine. And we are going to talk about the infrastructure for metaverse, because this is all still very much in question. We have have experienced some snippets of Mona. We saw that. And uh, the question is, is this advancing in a way that the world can accept and adopt? And I think it's the jury is really still out. Um, Matthew, you know, you create a lot of awesome experiences in metaverse. And what are you seeing? What is the communication that you're having in metaverse versus in real life? Uh, grateful uh, to be here, and thank you so much kind of for having us. Uh, you know, what we're really seeing uh, uh, kind of in this early stage in the development of the metaverse is the kind of desire uh, from the creator standpoint to come in and create unconstrained. They want to go in and create the worlds that they've seen in science fiction um, for the past couple decades, and they want to go in and build those worlds um, with the least amount of friction. So um, at Mona, we really strive to be creator first and unlock those creators for coming in and kind of building kind of those fundamental experiences for everyone else to come in and explore and have a great time in, and um, the technology uh, is here today for a, a lot of these experiences. Um, you know, for Mona, we're primarily browser-based uh, metaverse experiences, and that's a great way for people to access the metaverse today. Not everyone has a $400 headset or, or something that's more immersive, but certainly that's where this is all heading. And uh, we're laying kind of the groundwork for uh, the creators to go and create these worlds, uh, leading into these more immersive experiences uh, inside uh, AR and VR headsets. So you're the platform play and at Peregrine you're you're cre you're creating these these tools these graphics these experience these yeah. visual experiences tell us about the that as being part of the formula yeah what's really interesting about this is so built these platforms that you know teams like Mona and others are building those are tools that enable these creators to do the things that they want to do to tell the stories that they want to do my background is that I'm a filmmaker and you know from the starting in the late 90s my whole arc of my career came through the arc of technology so the democratization of for example the DVX 100 camera was a specific model of technology that empowered filmmakers like myself and many others and gave voices to all of these stories that are not being told by the traditional systems. You know, all of those things empowered those content creators. And when I look at some of the tools like Mona, they're doing the very same things. They're open, they're accessible. These are largely open source, you know, things tools that you need to accomplish this. And because of that access, because of the open source philosophy of the Web3 and you know, particularly the Web3 uh, space, it enables a lot of creators that were left out, locked out you know, of the system. And those are valuable stories that are going to shape humanity. And when these tools are out there in the world, we're, it's really going to have a tremendous impact. Well, let's talk about the stories that are not being told. I think that everyone here recognizes that we are on the periphery still. We exist on the edge, and a lot of people are still exploring what that is on the mainstream side. As a filmmaker and as a technologist and a as a storyteller and as a journalist, we all see the value of the stories that aren't being told. In your view, what, what are the stories that are being told that are so unique on Metaverse right now that is critical to our conversation in real life? Well, right now is, a, it is part of the question that you just asked. And right now, we're at a very unique time and place where the tools are here, and there are some amazing experiences that are coming to life. But again, it's very, very early with any of this technology that we're talking about in this space. It's very emergent. And 
what I think we're at this crossroads right now where these tools are incredible. Like, go check out the Metaverse installation if you haven't. It's back on the other side. Like, you'll get to taste what this really is. It's like, it's full video game kind of creative level. Uh, and that is going to empower a lot of people. It's going to empower a lot of creatives that w didn't have, like, the access. So anything with these tools is possible, and it's really hard to live with this open expanse of, like, it really is infinite, the types of things that are to come. But if you're from a place where, you know, you've got certain political things or whatever going on, like, these are the stories of human humanity, and they're expressed in really unique ways. Uh, yeah, and, and kind of on the, uh, to touch on that, on the creator side, you know, we're seeing those who have been um, working at AAA game studios their whole lives. They are really talented creatives and creators um, that are working on titles and franchises that might be kind of um, not telling the stories they want to tell themselves. And for the first time in their professional career, they're able to go out and create entire worlds and publish them and invite others into them with hundreds of other people to experience something that came directly from them in a, in a way that they have haven't been able to do ever, and now they're able to, you know, make a career doing that and have that freedom to create unconstrained. A lot of criticism still, though, about it. I mean, let's just take a look at Mark Zuckerberg and the uh, prediction that there would be 500,000 monthly users. It's actually only 200. They had to revise down their expectations. Some of the criticisms include the, the visuals, the graphics that seem still very much from the 90s and early 2000s. Those are criticisms that exist about the metaverse right now. What needs to happen to overcome? Is it a matter of hardware? Is it a matter of uh, core technologies? In your view, wh what do you think needs to happen? Certainly, um, we're seeing advances um, kind of across the board on um, you know, the hardware side from uh, GPU improvements to um, even like you know, having access to reliable internet to access a lot of these things like 5G or um, you know, with, with Starlink and some of those things like that. Um, and you know, uh, the fidelity of these worlds um, that is a, kind of a blocker for a lot of people. They, as I, as I mentioned earlier, you, um, we've been sold this vision on the metaverse and um, immersive worlds um, from you know, uh, cinema and science fiction for so long. It is photorealistic. It is beautiful. It is something that you want to escape to. And what we're seeing on the side of um, kind of Horizon Worlds and some of the others out there isn't that fidelity that we're, we're striving to go to. They're incredibly valid, and there's a lot of great experiences in those, but the fidelity isn't there. Um, at Mona, we strive to kind of unlock that highest level of fidelity for the creators to go in and create AAA looking uh, titles and experiences um, directly through the web browser. And part of the challenge there um, is on the creator side. They need to uh, uh, be, uh, have the ability to go in and optimize their assets, create game ready assets um, that look um, similarly to those you're, you're seeing kind of elsewhere. And um, you know, so uh, part of that is education and increasing the education of creators to be able to go and build um, kind of higher resolution, uh, higher fidelity worlds, and then unlocking uh, uh, suites of creator tools um, with the advancements in artificial intelligence and things like that um, to really kind of open up that higher fidelity range that we're really striving to get to um, and enter into and want to go into these worlds with. But therein lies the tension that exists between centralized and decentralization. I think everyone recognizes that in a democracy with full access and its fully decentralized, but what you get on the experiential side is very fragmented. There's very tribal kind of different perspectives on what that fidelity should cohesively be, which means that if there is a fully formed vision, it feels like it would come from a more centralized perspective. How do you balance that tension? Well, those platforms have certain advantages, but also decentralized networks also have their own advantages. So I think it, there's how I would kind of answer that question. Like, the technology's there. I mean, it's, it's always going to continue to get better. The, the, like, look at any of it, what, whatever kind of technology we're talking about. It's only going to get better. The devices are going to get less intrusive, more immersive. All of those things are happening, right? I don't... It, 
I think that if you look at the spectrum from, for example, like Minecraft, I'm just going to be used right. loosely, but you look at Minecraft, you look at Fortnite, you look at Roblox, you look at Mona, there's a huge spectrum between all of those different experiences. They share a lot of common attributes, but the major thing that it's, I don't actually think it's that much to do with technology. It is, of course, but the real thing about this is about community. Right? If you look at like why are people, why are kids going to Minecraft? It's because they have relationship, they have connection. All of these are basic, fundamental human needs that this technology is empowering in new ways. With some of these metaverse, and, and it's so new that we haven't really gotten to the stage where the communities, they're still early, they're small. And yes, everybody wants to use kind of Web2 growth metrics of like, you know, up and to the right. and. Yes, we're going that direction, but again, it's early and they're small, but it's going to go that way because when, the, when people get a hold of these tools, they're going to be able to satisfy those core human needs that they have those longings for, and those intrinsic motivations are going to grow these spaces because of the relationships. I would also argue, and I agree with you, that the technology does exist today, but perhaps the thesis, and it's, it's my own, is that you, know, you can have technology, but to get to a network effect, you also have to have economy. So what is the role of NFTs? What is the role of blockchain and crypto in metaverse? Uh, yeah, so you know, really, um, kind of what we are seeing um, uh, at Mona um, is you know the the de desire and the absolute need for the creators to have that kind of um, economic incentive to go and um, do this full time for uh, a living, go in and build and and create and uh, uh, and kind of exchange uh, digital assets um, to to do to move into this and experience it full time. And so uh, on Mona, all worlds are, are minted as NFT and those can be uh, exchanged and collected and, and sold and traded as well as um, moving into kind of more assets and, and, and kind of, uh, you know, having ownership over your stuff is really, really important. You think of, you know, the physical world, you um, carry with you all of your stuff. You have your laptop, your phone, your, your clothes, you go out into the world and um, you don't go into a different building and then you don't have any of your stuff anymore. You, um, the same thing needs to apply uh, into the virtual worlds. So you need to, uh, all of your stuff, you need to be able to take it with you wherever you go and have core ownership over those things. And the NFT technology kind of uh, is that unlock that we're seeing um, and, and really, really important to the uh, adoption of the open metaverse. With regard to NFTs, like I think we have some early examples of this. We can look at some data and try to understand what's going on here. I think if we look at the NFT boom, there's a whole bunch of things happening. I really spent some time trying to understand why did it happen? We were doing NFTs for years and nobody cared. And why all of a sudden? And of course, there's a variety of factors. The technology was evolving to a point where we had marketplaces. You know, we had all these core components, but there was no usage. People were talking, you know, the, the arguments you just made, they were saying the same things about NFTs. Nobody cares. Who cares? Well, all of a sudden, COVID happens. And all of a sudden, we have a huge use, a real use case for real people, artists that were disconnected from their markets. They couldn't go to the just even in a base case like a traditional auction house because nobody was going anywhere. And so they had this tremendous need and what it actually unlocked was the intrinsic motivation to overcome the barriers that had previously kept them out because they needed to do it. So they did figure it out even though the UX was maybe not as good as it could be. Again, it's evolving. Yeah. But they figured it out because they had a need. When we look at like the metaverse stuff, it's the exact same, the positive attributes that came out where you had artists that were not connected to the markets, whether from regional regions that weren't considered, but these are tremendous artists with tremendous stories. They found that market, and they found a sustainable way. There's no more starving artists. I don't know if anybody told you yet, but that is an outdated concept. M many artists have really struggled to be able to, with the vision, to feed their families or whatever, they meet their own basic needs because they have this vision that they have to share this story. And NFTs in the, in the JPEG sphere did that for a tremendous number of artists. And so then when you take this into the metaverse, it's exactly the same thing. These basic Web3 principles of ownership, self-sovereignty, right? All of these things that we talk about Web3, the metaverse has to be a Web3 metaverse because these are the imperative things to lead us forward. It is the evolution of the internet. It is hard to describe. 
I it love is. that metaphor of there's no such thing as a starving artist anymore because once upon a time in the ancient days of really restrictive capitalist structures, yep. you had to rely on benefactors. And now the technology has really paved the way for anyone really to create value. Uh, and I want to talk about that because as we look at real world use cases, it's we, we hear the positive aspect, we hear the vision, we, we support it, and at the same time, when you actually go out and experience it, it is not space I want my child to be in, it is not necessarily space I want to be in at the moment, um, because it feels very unsafe, and it feels like it's the kind of experiences are not, are not at the quality, the fidelity, the, the sociability uh, caliber that, that we are used to. How, how do developers, uh, both at the code level and at the platform level, think about this aspect hmm. of the infrastructure for metaverse? Yeah, so, you know, as you mentioned, kind of like uh, having those core experiences that you can feel safe in and having safe spaces to enter into is really, really important. And the more um, we allow those, uh, anyone to go and create their own space to enter into, um, the more welcoming it is for, for any sort of uh, participant, whether um, they're, they're um, you know, whoever is like looking to, to go in these worlds. For my, my nephews, they're building their own worlds right now and existing kind of close those platforms and they, it, you know, it might not be the highest fidelity in these things, but they are bringing their friends with them there in their own safe space and having their kind of community and their tribe in these worlds. So how do you ensure that safeness? Uh, you know, a lot of the, the, for the safeness of these is, is moderation. So it's really, uh, you have to have really good moderation tools for these to m uh, maintain a level of, of safeness for kind of any level of participant. Uh, one of the things you can do uh, kind of in these spaces at Mona is you can token gate them, so you can choose who gets to enter them. It's not an open free-for-all forum, although those community spaces are awesome, and we're seeing a lot of uses in those kind of like broader community level spaces to host events in, to host concerts, those types of things. But if you want still a smaller private gathering room with just your friends, you can lock that up uh, to a specific you know, token ownership and go on in and have a you know, really great uh, engaging conversations or play um, you know, a, a games or have your own kind of private events in these spaces uh, and have a really Really so I could host a metaverse birthday party and I would be the chaperone. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Right? I could yes. be the chaperone. Yes. I'd make sure all the kids are having fun. Right. Yeah. But we're really mimicking what we want to experience in real life and trying to create those experiences in metaverse. A lot of challenges. But what is what are the what are the things that we need to overcome, both on the hardware, maybe the code level, the experiential level, to get us to a world in which the adoption rates are, are much more mainstream than we're seeing right now? Well, I can't, I can't speak to hardware. Go ahead with the hardware. Let's start with the hardware, and then we'll talk about other stuff, if you might. Uh, there's a lot of great uh, uh, people working really hard on uh, uh, to improve the hardware um, uh, kind of constraints. And as I mentioned you know, previously, uh, you know, graphics cards. Um, for us specifically at Mona, it's it's more of the tooling and the creator tooling to make it easier to go and create and to expand these worlds, as, as well as you know, uh, with AI, uh, leveraging AI to um, you know, uh, broader populate the infinite vastness of virtual space. Um, and uh, you know, uh, you know. So to creator tooling is, is, is one thing, a, a big challenge that we're hyper focused on, um, as well as you know, uh, there's broader things like um, you know, uh, if this is supposed to mimic and have some level of parity with this world, um, we need to have this many people there. Hundreds and hundreds and thousands and millions of people need to share space and have that kind of uh, shared experience together that is synchronous and at the same time. And so that is a challenge that uh, still has not been solved. Um, and, but we need to get there as, a, as an ecosystem as, uh, uh, t together. Yeah, I think on, I, it's, it's interesting because I've seen examples of this like already that are in existence. We had a Metaverse build day on the 25th and we invited some artists that shared some really incredible work that's real and live. And Fractilians is one of the artists that was there and she was showing some of her work in education with kids in using VR and Metaverse 
you know, to be able to communicate. And what's interesting is that you might look at it and go, oh, it looks not the, it's not Hollywood, right? It's not a game studio quality of thing. But kids are actually finding a really tremendous meaning in these spaces and they have fun and they learn in a dimensional way. Like we're, we're three-dimensional humans and children learn because we're human. This is, this is our experience. And so this replicates it in really unique ways. And it doesn't have to be super polished for the, all of that communication and meaning to be transferred. And I don't think we should wait until it's perfect. We have to iterate. We have to start now because when we put these tools into the hands of all of these kids, they're going to build stuff that will blow your mind. My son is 12. He plays, I mean, Fortnite, he's organizing clans and they're building stuff. He's in Minecraft and they're doing all this stuff. And he shows me things that spin my head. And as soon as we give them the power and, and all this ownership over those assets that they're currently, well, I'm paying for him because he's 12. Yeah. So I'm buying a lot of Fortnite assets and I have zero to show for You're it. You're a cool dad. You're I want to cool sell them, but I can't. I'm like, let's sell that account. <laughs> but that type of thing, once they get a hold of some of those things, they're going to do incredible stuff. Well, look, I think we are all super aware of the world out there uh, in Ukraine, in Russia, across Asia right now in so many conflict zones that once upon a time, these, these cities and these countries in a world that are increasingly now existing in our head and possible that they are also going to be revived in metaverse as a front seat to history and that history continues as a reference point and as a contextual point for all of us. Thank you for all of your points and for sharing the vision of where we're going in Metaverse. And thank you all for being here. It's great. Thanks, guys. Thank you.